Well, it's great to be with you uh, here in London. I, I had the privilege uh, this morning to uh, witness a true black swan event. Uh, I actually saw sky and uh, uh, sun shining in London, so uh, that was uh, really uh, amazing to see. Yeah, last year uh, has been uh, a very, very interesting case, uh, uh, probably very unique in my career, uh, when we got the call from the Democratic National Committee asking us to uh, do essentially compromise assessment of their network uh, to determine if there's anything going on. Little did I know that uh, over a year later, this would still be a story dominating the front pages of, uh, of newspapers around the world, and uh, I feel like uh, I'll be going to my grave uh, with someone referring to, to me as, as, as being involved in that particular investigation. But it was um, a very, um, I think, unique event that highlighted the problems that we face with nation state actors um, that are engaged in a variety of activities beyond just traditional theft um, and uh, espionage that every country in the world engages in, but some of the more nefarious activities like information warfare, like destructive attacks that we're starting to see now um, that um, create particular challenges for us in cyberspace. What I want to do um, in the next 15 minutes is really give you a quick world tour of the different threat actors that we track at CrowdStrike, but from, from nation states to uh, criminal groups as well as um, hacktivists and, and terrorist organizations, and talk a little bit about the threats that um, uh, they all pose uh, because they're very different. Um, we fundamentally believe at CrowdStrike that understanding your enemy, understanding their motivations, their capabilities, what they're after is extremely important uh, when it comes to cybersecurity because unless you under understand your opponent, uh, you really cannot, uh, uh, cannot fight them uh, well. So this is our world map, uh, what we call an adversary zoo. So uh, a few of you may be familiar with CrowdStrike's uh, naming convention that I came up with when we started the company. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, started to annoy me, uh, this was now over six years ago when we started the company, is that every organization was creating different names for different operations, different campaigns, different actors. It was all kind of a, a jumbled mess and you couldn't remember um, what uh, they all referred to. And uh, I try to simplify things and uh, use a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek convention uh, to, to refer to different adversaries. So we use an animal scheme um, and uh, an animal that would refer to a particular country. Um, so of course, anything that's panda-related would be a Chinese nation-state activity, bears is Russian. Um, anyone know what a chalima is? Anyone in the audience? So it's actually the national animal of North Korea. It's a mythical flying horse. Um, so, you know, most countries tend to actually use real animals as, as their national animals, but uh, North Korea is unique in many, many respects. Uh, kitten is a ran, Persian cat reference there. Um, and then uh, we also use, um, uh, for criminal groups, we use a designation of spider. And uh, for activist groups, we use a, a designation of jackal. So let me talk a little bit about the different actors and, and what they're engaged in. Uh, let me start with China. China has been an adversary that we've been facing um, in the cyberspace um, from a nation state perspective for the better part of the last 15 years. Um, over, over the last um, uh, decade or so, they've been extremely uh, prolific, of course, in stealing intellectual property, leveraging that uh, state institutions, um, the uh, People's Liberation Army, um, their, their military, um, as well as their intelligence agencies, the, um, particularly the agency called the MSS, the Ministry of State Security, um, that have been engaged in cyber operations against both governments as well as private sector organizations to hover up uh, intellectual property, trade secrets, negotiations, and then provide it to companies in China, both state-owned enterprises as well as private sector organizations to um, enable those companies to compete better on the world uh, marketplace. So this activity was just absolutely astounding in terms of volume. Um, they were by far the most prolific adversary that we're facing. Um, nine out of 10 investigations that we would be called into at CrowdStrike uh, would end up being Chinese nation state activity until 2015. Uh, and in 2015, the most amazing thing happened where the initially the Obama administration um, uh, institute a policy that they would consider uh, putting sanctions in place, financial sanctions in place, not just against the perpetrators of these attacks, i.e. the uh, military, uh, um, uh, members of the Chinese military as well as their intelligence services, but the beneficiaries of the stolen data. 
i.e. the companies um, that are actually getting uh, the information and are trying to compete leveraging that information um, in the world marketplace. And um, that created an incredible situation where within days of um, the um, news article going out um, leaking that uh, the administration was about to embark on, on, in, um, uh, embark on this uh, uh, path, a huge Chinese delegation of about 40 people lands in Washington, D.C. This is right in the lead up to the President Xi's uh, summit with President Obama. And over the next two days, they negotiate uh, uh, at a hotel in, in, in downtown D.C. Uh, an unprecedented agreement where both countries agreed to uh, abandon um, any efforts to engage in commercial espionage or espionage done for commercial benefits. So this has nothing to do, of course, with stealing traditional national security secrets. Everyone engages in that type of activity. But stealing um, information and giving it to private sector companies is off limit. Of course, uh, from a United States perspective, um, they already had a policy not to perform this type of activity, mostly actually for very pragmatic reasons, because in, in America we don't have uh, really uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, we have a very robust competitive environment. So if you're stealing from a um, car company um, that um, you know, a U.S. intelligence agency might, might consider, you have a huge problem of who do you actually give it to? Do you give it to Ford? Do you give it to General Motors? Do you give it to Tesla? Do you give it to Toyota, who may be a Japanese company but still has a huge number of uh, jobs um, that are dependent on, uh, on their factories in the United States? So because of those practical reasons, the, the United States has long ago uh, instituted a policy that the U.S. government will not engage in espionage for commercial benefit. Uh, but of course, China was a big problem, and that type of statement um, was really a remarkable achievement uh, to receive. And that statement actually was shortly followed up um, with uh, other countries, including here in the UK, and then ultimately the G20, um, uh, all reaffirming that same commitment. And the most remarkable thing happened where over the next uh, year and a half, we had seen a dramatic reduction in Chinese nation state activity uh, following that agreement. And um, it remains to be seen how long it holds. And, uh, it didn't go completely away, but um, they still present uh, uh, certainly a very significant threat from a national security perspective. They, they by no means abandon their hacking of defense companies and government institutions. But the commercial side, we have seen a reduction, and we'll, we'll, we'll have to see if it, if it holds in the future. But I think um, uh, it can really be taken as a, the biggest success we have actually had in the cyber domain uh, in reducing the overall level of the threat uh, and um, it actually had absolutely nothing to do with our own cyber capabilities. It all had to do with realizing at the end of the day, this wasn't about hacking, this wasn't about cyber intrusions, this was about economic warfare done via cyber. And the right response to, um, to that uh, would be uh, financial sanctions and impacts to um, threaten the impact of the Chinese economy, and it really got their attention very quickly. Now let's go to um, another um, actor, the kittens, uh, Iran. Um, there we actually have a very different situation where, uh, of course, there was a nuclear agreement um, that um, uh, the P5 plus one um, set of countries uh, signed with Iran to curtail their, their nuclear program. And uh, what we saw is actually an increase in Iranian intrusion since that time. What happened is that uh, as uh, sanctions against Iran started to melt away and they became more integrated into the, the world economy, they realized that all the cyber capability that they had been developing for the last uh, really about 10 years uh, was very, very useful, not just for traditional um, national security related espionage, but also for economic espionage, taking the playbook uh, of the Chinese in this space. So we're seeing a lot of intrusion activity in aerospace, in energy, and other com uh, industries um, uh, in, in Europe and as well as in America from Iranian actors steal intellectual property. The other thing that we're seeing from Iranians, which is even more disturbing, is destructive attacks. And in fact, um, when I look at the, the threat landscape, one of the things that worries me a great deal is that we've sort of moved from the first stage of, of cyber where everyone was just focused on theft, whether it was uh, criminals trying to steal your credit cards or, or bank accounts uh, numbers or um, nation states trying to steal your intellectual property. Now we're routinely dealing with hugely destructive attacks, um, like the um, NotPetya attacks um, that we witnessed earlier this summer. Um, they're devastating organizations. So there have been companies that have suffered 
uh, over $300 million in damage uh, uh, from one of these uh, uh, destructive attacks. And one of the things that worries me in particular, particularly when we get to the criminal group uh, groups and their motivations, is what I call the uh, proliferation of enterprise ransomware, where you basically have a situation where you can hold the company hostage by taking down their systems, encrypting their data wholesale, taking them out of business temporarily, and at that point, you can ask for almost any amount of money um, uh, to, to get the, the company back online. So we worked um, over the last couple of months with a number of companies that have been impacted uh, by these, uh, these uh, highly destructive attacks, and at that stage, we're not talking to the chief information security officer or the CIO. We're talking directly to the boards of directors and CEOs of these huge companies, and uh, we were constantly getting questions from them of, can we just write a check? Can we pay $10 million? Can we pay more to get ourselves back online quickly? And uh, the answer, of course, in those particular situations was, no, you can't, because it really wasn't a ransomware attack. It was a destructive attack. Uh, but those types of things I think we'll see a lot more of in the coming um, months as criminals realize what a huge potential it is to um, really get millions of, of dollars uh, very, very quickly from organizations um, that need to get their business back up online because everyone is so dependent now on these technologies. Uh, but in the case of Iran, what we've witnessed is, is a huge wave of destructive attacks against Saudi Arabia. Of course, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran have, uh, are locked in kind of in a geopolitical struggle, uh, both in Syria and in, in the civil war uh, that uh, each side is, is sponsoring in Yemen. And um, uh, that, uh, uh, civil, uh, that, that sort of covert battle um, that they are engaging in, the proxy war, is manifesting itself in the cyber domain as well, where the Iranians have repeatedly attacked major organizations in Saudi Arabia, both government institutions, as well as uh, their private sector, their energy sector, their financial sector, um, their um, uh, uh, civil aviation uh, administrations. Um, and um, uh, that is an extremely worrisome sign that you're starting to see these nation states engaging in these destructive attacks and normalizing um, uh, that, the whole concept that even critical infrastructure like the financial sector or civil aviation is not immune uh, to these sorts of things. So I worry a great deal that um, there's a lot of discussions um, uh, that are taking place at the UN and other forums about the need to develop cyber norms. And while those discussions are taking place, the norms are already being established in this domain when these nation states are acting essentially with impunity and um, doing things like attacking critical infrastructure. So let's move over to another actor um, as we, we keep going around. Um, the world here, let's talk a little bit about Russia. Um, so the Russians, you may have heard, uh, have done a few things in cyberspace uh, as of late. Um, and uh, they're one of the most capable actors that we actually see uh, in our regular investigations. Um, and um, um, they're interesting because um, uh, for many, many years, uh, they've been engaged in use of cyber for traditional espionage collection. Um, they're one of the earliest countries, along with the United States, that really realized the potential of this domain to revolutionize espionage. Uh, General Michael Hayden, who used to run the NSA and the CIA, um, said it, um, uh, a number of years ago that we now live in the golden age of signal intelligence, where um, uh, the unprecedented capability of cyber, the interconnectedness of this world, allows intelligence agencies to hover up so much information um, that was unthinkable uh, prior to, to this development. Well, the Russians realized this early on. One of their earliest hacks was in 1986. There's a wonderful book called Cuckoo's Egg uh, by an astronomer at Berkeley Labs that caught an intrusion into his university system in 1986 and in many ways pioneered a lot of the technologies that we now use today, like honeypots and intrusion detection system and forensic work that didn't exist then that he had to invent to try to investigate this hack, and uh, almost single-handedly without um, any help, in fact, in, in many ways, um, with many obstacles created by the government at the time, managed to track down the perpetrators, uh, one of the earliest um, uh, examples of attribution in cyber. So many people think that attribution is impossible. It was done all the way back in 1986, and it's only gotten, frankly, easier since then. But one of the things that uh, he was able to do is track it down to individuals um, operating in uh, Germany who uh, 
when they were arrested, they realized that they were working on behalf of the KGB to try to steal military secrets from the United States 30 years ago, over 30 years ago. So um, the Russians have continued in that space, but one of the things that they've been doing as of late is engaging in information warfare, weaponizing information, putting it out there, as we saw happening during the U.S. election um, and uh, in many other cases, particularly in Ukrainian elections uh, in 2014. And uh, the other thing that's really worrisome is that we're seeing a huge wave of destructive attacks that they're engaged in uh, in Ukraine, uh, uh, going after their power grid, going after their aviation sector, and again, normalizing this environment where you have um, a situation that uh, a nation state uh, is careless enough to, to engage in that type of activity and affect uh, many, many lives. And lastly, I, I want to, uh, we're running out of time here, but I want to highlight North Korea. Out of all these actors that you have on, uh, on the slide here, they are the ones that worry me the most. Um, they are the ones that have tremendous capabilities. Uh, we tracked down the activity going way back to 2004. Uh, they've been um, ex um, extending them and uh, polishing their operations um, over the years as they, they've been cons consistently attacking South Korea almost year after year uh, with both destructive attacks, with ransomware attacks, uh, botnets and DDoS, and uh, um, the thing that worries me the most is that um, if there is an escalation uh, in that region, um, if there, uh, there are signals um, that the North Koreans may interpret that the United States may launch a conventional armed attack against them, perhaps against their nuclear facilities or against the, re the regime, that they will attempt to deter that attack through cyber. And one of the things that I think they're very likely to do is target our financial sector, the global financial sector, and try to do a destructive attack that they're very, very familiar with and have executed in the past against famously Sony Pictures, you may remember a few years ago, but also a number of organizations in, in South Korea. And um, they certainly have the, have the capability, they would certainly have the motivation because they're one of the few states in the world that is actually very disconnected from the global financial system and they themselves wouldn't suffer much from, the, um, um, uh, from, from such an attack, whereas everyone else wouldn't really have that motivation given their inter interdependence on the global financial sector. So that actor um, and the potential that we may see a highly, highly destructive and virulent attack uh, from that regime is um, the thing that worries me uh, a great deal. And uh, I think uh, everyone should be paying a lot of attention, not just to their nuclear program and their missile tests, uh, but certainly their capabilities in cyber. A lot of people have asked me, how is it possible that North Koreans, uh, who are such a poor regime, their people are starving, um, they're so backward in so many ways, uh, how can they have these sophisticated capabilities? And um, of course, anytime someone is capable of building an intercontinental ballistic missile or a nuclear weapon, uh, you shouldn't underestimate their techn technological prowess, prowess uh, and um, uh, with, with regards to cyber, they have been doing this for the last 13 years. They've been steadily improving, and um, um, just like with anything else, you put enough effort, you put enough time into it, and you're able to uh, achieve uh, great results, and uh, that's exactly what we've seen uh, with those actors. And very lastly, I, I want to mention the hacktivist threats. Uh, we're increasingly starting to see the use of cyber by um, terrorist organizations, so one of the actors that's here on the slide uh, um, actually um, got left off, um, uh, but an actor we call Festive Jackal uh, is actually our name for um, the Hezbollah. Uh, and um, uh, we're seeing increasing activity from them and other Middle Eastern actors that is increasingly worrisome as they're conducting um, intrusions to identify individuals that they may ultimately target in the physical world with assassination attempts and the like. So cyber is really enabling all types of operations uh, for both nation states, criminal groups, and, and hacktivist threats that uh, don't just uh, constrain themselves to, to cyber itself, to the virtual domain, but also to the physical world. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and this quick world tour that uh, we went on in the last 15 minutes, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.